Hi, I'm Dr. Bosworth. Welcome back to my channel. I am an internal medicine physician and I am here to do a little education on the ketogenic diet. And today we're going to really focus on brains. We've had several lectures on that and I've really found them interesting as I study about them. I hope you're learning something from them too. I want to take a quick second to say if you really want to support this channel, the best thing you can do is uh, buy the book that I wrote uh, any way you can. This book uh, is a love letter I wrote to my mom when she was 71 years old and trying to die of cancer. I was learning about the ketogenic diet and these are the lessons that I wrote her. Uh, one of my favorite teaching tools and it is absolutely the foundation for how I support the time and energy put into this channel. So if you like what I'm doing, please give a shout out to the book. Uh, if you have a neighbor that needs one or a preacher or a friend or a doctor, <laughs> I've seen that done. It really is so, I'm so thankful for the folks that have bought it and have shared it. Um, and I do think it's changing lives in amazing ways. So let's get ready for a lesson. Uh, today we are going to talk about brains and we're going to do a little bit of a recap on one other lesson because I think it really ties into this lesson. And then we're going to come back and I'm going to teach you a few reasons why I continue on the ketogenic diet. So let's get started. I am going to start by saying um, ketones. Ketones are a bridge that, that bridge, ketones bridge the brain gap. Let's try that again. Ketones bridge the brain gap. So we're going to go back one slide and I want you to take a look at this in hopes that you remember one of the other slides that I spent a lot of time unpacking, which is this study saying when we studied glucose and ketones, we found that in healthy brains that unlike what I learned in medical school, ketones are preferred over glucose when they're available. It's really important that you pay attention to those words when they're available. If all your brain has for fuel is glucose, by golly, it will use a ton of glucose. But if you look at that red line way at the bottom, those ketones on day four and how red that brain is, that is four days into a strict ketogenic diet in healthy people that found where they found their ketones were very high by day four, and look at how much of their brain is being fueled by ketones. So that's healthy brains. Today we're gonna to talk about ketones and how they bridge this brain gap when it comes to energy. So as a physician studying internal medicine, I get to see lots of brains that are aging. So in uh, this study, they looked at a ketogenic diet using medium chain triglycerides. And they're here to show, the, the study shows, that it increases the brain metabolism in Alzheimer's disease. And we bring this up because that last slide and that last slide deck that I uh, did a whole lecture on, it really focused on healthy brains. And people say, well, what about mine? I have depression. I have um, bipolar. I have uh, Parkinson's. I have a tremor. And so I picked one of the most diseased brains, one of the toughest brains to talk to patients about, which is Alzheimer's. And that's what this study focuses on. So we're going to start by looking at this slide um, where it shows the brain energy. So you, this might be obvious, but your brain should have 100% energy. All the cells in your brain should be fueled. So this, uh, this chart just focuses on the 70% brain fuel, 80% brain fuel, 90% brain fuel, and 100% brain fuel. So what happens in brains that aren't working very well is they don't have enough fuel for all of the cells. We call this a brain energy gap. And this is represented here by this white box. Uh, think of this line at the bottom as the 88th percent. At 88 percent of the fuel for the brain, it does not work so well. And in Alzheimer's, that's very well studied, that when they get below 88 percent, their memory lapses. They're not doing very well. There's several other studies that show that brain fuel is not doing so well when brains become insulin resistant, which is why this study is applicable for the rest of you. So let's take a look at this chart. Um, it shows that these are this young, healthy control group. So unlike the rest of the, the, the charts that you're going to see here, these people were young. And you can see that their brain fuel goes all the way to the top. The red part of the bar is the part of their brain that was fueled by glucose. That top little 5% is the part that was fueled by ketones. And you can see that there's a zero energy gap. They have 100% of their brain being fueled. That sounds pretty ideal. Yep, they were young and healthy. Now we took an older set, but they didn't have any memory problems. We tested their memory and they performed just great. But these next several bars, including this one, are folks in their 70s, uh, up, in, up into their 80s. 
So if you look, that glucose supplies the brain with 89% of its needed fuel. So it's just 1% over what it needs to be for nobody to notice that anything's wrong with their brain. They have 3% of their brain using ketones, and they have 8% of their brain that's going without fuel. And this is the part that's hidden. Even though these older folks tested normal, when we looked at their PET scans, we could see that there was 8% of their brain cells that had no fuel to do the things that they were asking it to do. And that's the part that I think is the scariest. In Alzheimer's, uh, in, in brains that age, there is this hidden component that, that lingers for years before patients have symptoms. These uh, phases of not having symptoms happen in other diseases as well, but I think Alzheimer's demonstrates it the best. And there's a ton of research on it, so I have good scans and good graphs for you. Let's now look at somebody with mild memory problems. So again, this would be considered mild cognitive disease. So if I was doing a test of their memory, I would say that they didn't outright fail it, they just scored low enough on the memory test and low enough on that screening test for Alzheimer's that I'm a little worried. I'm not sure that driving a car might be the best idea. There'll be some other things that I'm worrying about in a patient who scores with mild cognitive impairment. If you'll look though, look at that fuel. It has sunk down to 85% of that brain is being fueled by glucose. And still 3% is being fueled by ketones and it is under that 88% threshold. That's where that memory problem shows up. And when folks come in and say, hey, I just have a little bit of a problem on that memories test. I think I can, you know, I can try harder. Uh, what I want them to focus on is there is a larger gap of your brain that's going without fuel. And there is an answer that you can do to bridge this gap, this missing energy gap. The title is going to give it away. All right, let's move on to people who had this mild cognitive problem. And they took uh, 30 grams of MCT every day. This went on for a month, and we studied their brain scans as they looked at the increasing rise in ketones in their blood, and then watch what happens to the increase in their um, energy fuel for their brain. So first of all, they were down to 84% of their glucose, uh, of their brain was being fed by glucose. So again, that's much lower than it should be. Um, their ketones, though, had risen to 7% of their brain fuel was now being used to bridge the gap of, of, of energy. They were down to only 9% of a gap in their energy gap, whereas the people without any MCT had closer to 12%. Last but not least, we have the column that shows you what happens if they did 45 grams of MCT. Uh, for those of you that are new to keto, MCT stands for medium chain triglycerides, and these are very special fats that slip through the intestine without a uh, a traditional way of being absorbed and digested. Uh, they actually uh, are ported through the portal vein. They are ported to your liver and they turn into ketones. After you consume MCT, it does take about a half an hour to an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, to get the ketones into your uh, circulation, to measure them in your circulation. But that medium chain triglyceride are ketones made by your liver, but they are um, uh, supplied by this very special size fat that is eight carbons or 10 carbons long. I have another video on that and I'm going to not get distracted with that detail. So if you look at these folks with the 45 grams of MCT, and again, they were the folks who tested with mild cogn cognitive impairment. They weren't the severe Alzheimer's. This is just mild cognitive impairment. And they too fell below that threshold for meeting um, the, uh, for meeting the, the needs of their brain. Their glucose was 84% of the brain was being fueled by glucose. And when they added 45 grams of MCT, 10% of their brain was fueled by ketones. This left only 6% of their brain to have a brain energy gap. I would have just point out that the people who were testing normally, these folks tested even, I mean, their, their brain scans showed even more of their brain being properly fueled, meeting the demands that their brain was asking for. Now, this can get a little sciencey and you can get a little overwhelmed, but I just want you to really focus on that we're talking about brain energy here. And brain energy is almost always fueled by glucose when you're not on a ketogenic diet. In fact, in medical school, I believed and I was taught that brains can only use glucose. It's just that time right before you die when you're starving to death that you'd ever use a ketone in the brain. 
that's what I was taught. But here indeed, as we've continued to learn about the ketogenic diet and why it's so powerful in the anti-seizure movements and in other brain disorders, uh, it's this next part that is powerful. So there is your ketone, um, or there is your glucose uh, columns for the healthy people on the far right or far left. And then as you move across, all of them have um, uh, are in their 70s, except for that first column. The first, uh, the second column did not have a memory problem, the other three did. So as you look, here's that part that has the brain energy gap. Again, anything below 88% was gonna show up positive on my test. If 88% of the cells in their brain were properly fueled, then I couldn't find the memory problem. But if there was any part missing, then I saw this brain energy gap. As we look at what happens in healthy people, you can fill that top 5% with ketones in the healthy people. You can fill about 3% in the elderly that were still testing normally in their memory problems. And as we move forward into those, we uh, the middle column did not have any supplements. They did have mild cognitive disorder. And they had a large 12% of their brain was starving, screaming for fuel. Uh, we moved that, uh, we, we bridged the gap with ketones in the column that's number four, and we bridged it even better when we increased the dose of medium chain triglycerides to 94% of their brain was properly fueled. Uh, this is an incredible and remarkable finding to say, you know, when we first, when I first learned about Alzheimer's, we didn't have any idea that they could use a different fuel. And we talk about Alzheimer's as being a, um, a brain that's not working well. And uh, the, the studies that, that looked into this really poured energy into finding out, are we certain that um, these uh, elderly brains that aren't working right can use a different fuel? And the PET scans found in this study uh, really were an another, there's m multiple studies out there, but this one was a very nicely done study to show, yes, and we can supplement them with medium chain triglycerides to get them there. The previous study, the one that I started out this uh, talk on, was done showing you the supplements for medium chain triglycerides. When I look at um, the other parts of a brain disorder that I think are super important, they include things like, Doc, I can't focus. I, I have memory problems and I don't think it's Alzheimer's. I had a brain injury. I had a concussion. I have chronic headaches. I have depression. Um, I suffer with anxiety. My mood goes up and down. Those, uh, this list of, of symptoms are all chronic swelling, swelling found in brains. From concussions to addiction, uh, to migraines, to sleep disorders, these brains are swollen and they're not healthy. When we look at how can we bridge uh, the ketone uh, bridge gap, how can ketones bridge the gap? The important part that I like to have folks remember is this is a this is a very big finding for uh, people when they're struggling. When they come in for depression or when they come in for um, have, ha having had an injury, having had a concussion, when they've had 40 years of migraines, monthly migraines saying, ah, oh, it's just my period. I'm saying, no, don't do that. Your brain is not going to age well if you do that. And one of the things we start with is improving uh, their ketones, improving how their brain uh, not just ages, but how it's functioning when the symptoms show up and say, I've got brain fog, I just can't seem to figure it out. The part that I want to drive home though is that you can't just guess on what your ketones are. You really do have to measure. Uh, the, in the show notes, you'll find my favorite tool, which is Foracare. Um, I had a patient uh, turn me on to this saying, at least when they buy the expensive strips to measure their ketones, that it works on the first try. So I was a bit frustrated and had found multiple times I was buying these cheap strips for ketones for a different monitor and dang it, it really, uh, I wasted six, <laughs> six of them one time to get my number. Um, but most of them are pretty good, but I really like Foracare because it is really reliable. And I always think when a diabetic page, patient tells me which uh, monitor that they like, I should, I should listen and pay attention. So that's how I found Foracare. Um, but it, it, the key thing is, is people will write in and say, Doc, my friend has Alzheimer's. My friend has a memory problem. Can I give them MCT and can I give them ketones? Um, can I give them ketones in a can? And I say, yes, you can. But the key component is to measure them. 
uh, when you're guessing about what your ketones are, um, you're, you're, you know, and you're saying I'm not getting the effects I want, uh, you're, you're missing the point of why this diet is such a powerful teaching tool for not just me, not just my colleagues, but patients. Uh, you know, I, I actually am fasting right now and have checked my numbers. This is uh, my glucose number is 65, there you go. Uh, and then I checked my ketones right before I started. I'm about 27 hours into my fast, that's a 2.4. So that's a really good Dr. Boz ratio. Um, and I've found that when I do fasting, uh, the reason I do fasting is because of um, that uh, I like the accountability for knowing what my numbers are too. So we're going to finish out with a few more quick slides to say, here's the punchline. You see all those studies that say, yes, brains do better when, you, when they're properly fueled. Uh, if you're going to supplement with, with, um, by in increasing your ketones, I think you should know this. So let's finish this out. So ketones bridge the brain gap. Yes, they do. And when you look at which ketones are the best, we have uh, a good, we have better, and we have best for ketones. And when I look at what I use for um, teaching tools from the ketones, if you look at some ketones, they only last two to three hours in circulation. Um, other ketones, that you can get them up to two to six hours in, um, in circulation. So you can poke your finger for up five and a half, six hours after taking those types of ketones and find them uh, in circulation. And then there's some that will increase your ketone production for days to weeks afterwards. So let's do the big reveal. What is a good ketone? Good ketones are those made from BHB, otherwise known as beta-hydroxybutyrate. I like to call these ketones in a can. It's because they were made in the 60s. Uh, they are not, um, they're not too exciting to make. They're a salt. They don't taste very good, so most of the supplements have a, a sweetener in them. Uh, they're also called exogenous ketones but they only last for two to three hours in circulation. So if you're gonna use those as a way to improve your ketones, you're gonna to have to dose several times a day. If you want the next layer of what my recommendations are, median chain triglycerides. And this is with a specific caveat that these MCTs are uh, C8, C10. Be very careful to look at the label for these supplements that that's the kind you're getting. If you find a really cheap MCT powder or MCT oil, um, be careful. They're probably putting a bunch of C12 in that, and that does not increase your ketones. That acts just like any other fat. We want these special fats to increase ketones in people who are trying to figure out how to become keto-adapted. I often think of these supplement phases for my, my teenagers <laughs> because I can get them to take these. Um, we limit their carbs in their diet, but boy, um, if I'm supplementing, we get a, a one-two knockout punch for helping their ketogenic diet. Um, but more importantly, if somebody's brain isn't working right, and I'm trying to get their brain uh, in a better phase, um, supplementing with BHB or supplementing with MCT C8, C10 is a great hack to get them over the edge of getting their brain feeling better. Fuel their full brain before you ask them to produce the best kinds of ketones. And that is the, the fasting. Uh, I'm fasting today and showed you my numbers on purpose because I, I made an improved amount of ketones today because I deprived food for over, I think I'm at 28 hours of fasting. Now, if life goes well, I'll go home and not snitch on supper and I'll get to bed before having any calories and I'll wake up tomorrow morning with a goal of trying to get to like 36 or 40 hours of fasting. If I can do that once a week for the rest of my life, it sounds like a really big goal. And when I first started, I wasn't very good at it. Um, but I would contend that if people could do fasting uh, once a week to ignite their autophagy, to ignite the recycling that happens in your body, your brain will last you until the moment God puts you in that grave. I really believe that we can take the power of science, uh, especially in a ketogenic diet, and enhance the brains uh, in my clinic, but also in your home. Uh, I hope this, uh, I hope this uh, lecture series, this slide deck, really drove home the point, which is, yes, you can supplement ketones to get your brain to work better. It is a great way to begin if your brain's not working well or if you're just not very disciplined about how to get onto a ketogenic diet. Those studies were done on folks who were not on a ketogenic diet and then put on a ketogenic diet, um, meaning 
actually try it again. Those, fo those studies were done with people who continued to use carbohydrates. Uh, they just had to get the ketones high enough in their circulation in order for it to affect their brain. So we could see that the slope that the brain was hungry for ketones was the same in healthy young brains as it was in elderly brains with mild cognitive impairment. And I think that is the most powerful, hopeful thing to offer my patients, which is, look, having Alzheimer's, having a brain that doesn't work is an awful prison as you age. Making sure that your, your brain has as much fuel as it can burn is one way to awaken that brain in a better functioning setting. So using medium chain triglycerides, using BHB is a safe way to begin, but the best ketones, the ones that I like to use every week, are the ones I find when I fast. That will increase my metabolism for the next, for the next week, actually, as I continue on a just normal ketogenic diet after I do my fast. Well, I hope that was helpful. I'm signing off again as Dr. Boz, trying to improve your health one ketone at a time. Until next time.